What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Hobby Talk, a cardboard podcast. I'm not going to lie, Ricky. I did not expect to be recording this video today based on uh, Mrs. Murph and how she's doing, but it is a pleasure yeah. to be here talking the hobby with you today. Let's get some pleasantries out of the way. Ricky, how are you doing on this fine, fine morning? Um, I'm doing good. It's been a, a last few, a, lot, a good last few days of baseball. All the games have been entertaining. Um, like you just said, I'm excited for that new card collector to, to come into the world. I, I can't wait. I'll spoil it a little bit. The post is going to be somewhere on the lines of like, Hey, we just hired a new employee. Welcome him to the <laughs> hobbies. It, it's going to, it's going to be something corny like that. Uh, it's not going to be basic. It's going to be, uh, yeah, I mean, we just hired somebody and maybe I'll make like a post like an hour before, like, Hey, we're looking to hire. And then I'll make that post that we hired somebody. I think it's going to be super cool. But no, uh, any day, honestly, any second. I mean, we could be recording right now, Ricky, and I'm going to get a call. So it's it's just a matter of time. But super exciting, though, nonetheless. Um, maybe maybe in, in, in a little bit of time, have him propped up right here, and he can give us a couple thoughts. I mean, he might not be able to put the words together, but he can point to his gestures. He'll he'll tell me that PSA is is overhyped and in uh, that um let's see what else are we gonna talk about we're gonna talk about why you should start collecting Pokemon we're gonna talk about the grading report so I mean there's definitely a lot to get into and it would be very exciting if at three months he's right there you know just kind of slapping his thoughts around so but now that we have the pleasantries out of the way Ricky I kind of alluded to this before we started recording I'm gonna ask you where do you want to start I, mean, I kind of want to talk about. I just brought it up. I want to talk about um, playoff baseball in particular time. Because as everyone knows, he got the 50-50 this year. And if anyone knows tops, you know, they can't miss an opportunity to make money for any moment. So now they're releasing a whole 50-50 Otani top set. <clears throat> where the chase is a one on one logo man autograph, which is, I mean, cool. Like, that set is going to have so many autographs. It's watered down. Like, they're making you pay for it now. And this set doesn't even come out. How much is it? Box. You know, 240 a box. 240 box. So this kind of reminds me a little bit of that uh, the Mercury Wemby that we kind of talked about last episode. Yeah. Yeah. Is like, are we watering down these athletes? Are we watering down their autographs? And someone made a point where it's like with Wembenyama, who didn't have any Panini autographs. I think Tops and Fanax is trying to catch up a little bit to try to give us collectors autographs. And from that angle, it makes a little bit of sense. But from the angle mm -hmm. of Otani where he's had autos, uh, what is he on his seventh year playing now? He's had autos all these years. They are out there. Patch cards are out there. Numbered cards are out there. I mean, it's definitely a nice idea to commemorate the historic season that he had, uh, without a doubt. But, I mean, I think that's a set that should be like $25 that everyone can get their hands on. And, sure, if you want to mix in autographs and numbered cards and select random boxes, sure. But that chase is only going to drive up the price of this cheap $25 commemorative set. So it's almost like we're just running in place. I mean, I, I like the idea of them. I even mentioned this last time about the, the Wemby thing. You know, if they do this for another player and another player, I, I like the idea of making these player exclusive sets. I think it's a really good idea, but it's the execution of it. I think the $8,000 Wemby sets, I think a little overboard is this Otani $250 set better i guess only time will tell but i think it's a general better direction than the mercury wemby set because at least 250 dollars is more obtainable and easier to buy for most people yeah. than eight thousand dollars set i still haven't seen any updates on that wemby set like i don't when is that releasing i like, thought I, it was I, supposed to be releasing i thought i saw the october i thought i saw Obviously, which right. is now. But um, let me ask you this. So, because I've been watching and listening a lot, and people have been talking about this Wemby set. 
And a lot of people saying that it should go for more money than $8,000. And, you know, we kind of mentioned this too, you know, look at these top Chrome autographs, look at the Bowman Chrome autographs and, you know, compare them, you know, where you're going to get patches out of this one patch autos. And it's like $8,000 just in a vacuum is a very, very steep price tag. Now, listen, could this set be worth more than $8,000? Sure. But like, when you want to put cards in collectors' hands, you do need to be conscious of the price tag. And of course, Wemby isn't just any other player, or his cards aren't just any other cards. So there's a little bit more that needs to go into it than just putting cards in collectors' hands. But it's going to be a really, I don't want to say a tough sell because it's probably already sold out. But like, yeah. I think it's going to be a tough, tough flip, maybe. I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, because there's going to be people that are going to flip it, obviously. But like if you buy the box, you're gonna open the box and you might sell the cards individually. You might be able to get eight thousand dollars back on a couple cards, but I mean no one cares for the base cards. Probably a lot of people don't even care for the um the generic patch cards if they're not player worn. So I, I just think there's a I don't wanna say a marketing thing that goes into it, but again, that there's a a strategic element that goes into it that I think that they're missing the mark on. What is it? I have no idea. But I just feel like that there's something that they could have done better with this set to make it more obtainable for people like you and I, collectors yeah. with bigger and, and smaller budgets. But um, for the first well, player exclusive set, I think it's a good start, I guess, to try to spin it positively. Uh, what, what, what people don't realize, companies like Tops, Panini, they really don't care about the secondary market i mean yeah it affects like how much how like how much of each set they know because if no one's flipping then no one wants the cards then no one's gonna buy the set but when they when they release these sets and all that stuff they don't really care how much money you can make they're, as long as they get their money they're good they're not like Panini, I mean, sorry, not Panini. They're not like PSA who's going to take a chunk of your profits with each car. Like, once once they get their money, they're good. They know what they're doing. They know the price point they want. So whether you make some money on it or not, it's not their problem. It, like, that's what people don't realize. <laughs> sorry, I keep saying that, but, like, People go on and on about saying, oh, this product sucks because this box sucks. This product sucks because this box sucks. If everyone made their money back on every box, it would, a lot of, like, it would, it would cost a lot of money. Like, people don't realize everyone's not going to hit every turn. I tell people oftentimes, actually every time at the shop, I'm like, no matter how much you put, how much you spend on the box, if you can get half your money back, that's a win. Whether you're buying a $20 box, a $200 box, or a $2,000 box. If you can make, not including every card a dollar, but if, if you can get half your money back, that's a huge win. Otherwise, you got to look into it as you're throwing money out the door and you're having fun, which a lot of people do that without even thinking. You know, they'll go to like the arcade or they'll, they'll go to the, you know, the casino or the whatever. They'll just throw money to have fun. And people don't think of that when it comes to sports cards. They don't. Or, you know, even Pokemon cards, I, I think they do. I think people have a pretty good grip on how much they're spending and what they're getting out of it. And they don't look at it as a, oh, let me open this booster box and go for this $200 card and not have fun in it. Obviously, you can go hunting for the chase card as well. But I think it's a lot easier and more people have more fun when it comes to ripping Pokemon than they do with sports. Because I think the hill is a lot steeper for these sports cards. Because for $300, $400, you're only going to get seven cards. For $2,000 for National Treasure, you're only going to get, uh, what is it, 10 cards or whatever it is. So, like, there's a huge discrepancy there between what you're going to get and how much you're spending when it comes to sports versus Pokemon. But I do want to spin it back to the Otani thing really quickly. Is, and this, I guess this is a two part, two part, but I want to hear what your thoughts are first on this. The Otani 5050 set that they're making, do you think they could have? twisted it like the Wembenyama Mercury set called it freaking Jupiter I don't care what they call it and give us eight nine ten cards two of them are autos one of them's a patch auto it's eight thousand dollar box and all that stuff do you think they could have twisted it like that and it's still I mean because this 
one that they're coming out is going to be popular, of course. But do you think it would have still had that same level of popularity that the two hundred fifty dollar box has, and or do you think it'll still have or would have the popularity that the Wembenyama box is having? So the reason why I don't think they could have, why I don't think it's the same thing, is because this Otani set is all about a moment, mm -hmm. not the player himself. Like the reason. Like one of the reasons why the Victor Women Young boxes so much is because he has a dual autograph with LeBron James. One of a bonus auto. Look for a bonus auto. <laughs> uh, well, like, well, that's the thing. Like, one Otani is the biggest MLB player. Victor Victor is not the biggest NBA player. He's just the most liked. You're gonna get um, a lot of people mad with that. <laughs> oh well. Um, I know it's it's hard to excite col collectors with a dual autograph that already features Otani. Like, who's the next player they could put? Mookie Betts. I love Mookie, but people yeah. aren't drooling over him. Mike Trout. That hype kind of has come and gone. He has his collectors, but yeah. I mean, like I said, the fact that this is all about a moment and not the player. I think it is different. So, oh, and it's not rookie. Do you think they could have done a moment kind of set with Wemby commemorating his rookie season because he did a lot of accomplishments? In, in reality, you know, youngest five by five player, um, obviously tall. You know, just you know, just kind of going the course of the season, especially since uh, oh, was, <laughs> Panini couldn't um, do anything special. Or I mean, they could have, but they didn't. You know, in terms of like, hey, here's a Wemby uh, commemorating a 30 point game, or whatever. You know, these are numbered to 30 in this next Prism set, or you know, whatever. They could have done stuff like that, but they didn't. So, do you think mm -hmm. a Wemby? I mean, I think it's a little late now because the season's about to start at the end of the uh, you know two weeks. But like, do you think they could have done something like that instead of an eight thousand dollar box? And if it would have been better, if they did. See, like that's a no. I think, I think they played this one v one right because, like I said, the reason why it's so expensive is because it's dual auto. Mm -hmm. They could have had a moment if, like, one v dunked on LeBron James or something like that, where they could have both signed it. But no, nah, okay. I, I, yeah, I, I, I think this was the right move for them. Interesting. Very, very, very interesting. Um. Wow, what do you, do you think? think? I mean, I think they could have. And I think, obviously, it's too late. I, I still even think it's a little late for this Mercury set to, to come out because it's not rookie year. If they did it two months ago, I think that would have been a lot better timing. So I think just the timing's a little bit off. On regardless what angle they did it, I definitely would have liked to have seen a Wembenyama set because he is so special. He is a freak of nature. He is living up to the hype. He is playing well. And now that we're getting this $8,000 box shoved down our throats, it would have been nice to kind of see a more budget-friendly alternative for those who mm -hmm. can't afford the $8,000 box, like a Otani uh, moments set, you know, something like that. And you can even mix in the Olympics cards for that matter too, just kind of draft night. Here's, you know, summer league. Well, he didn't play in summer league, but. I think it would have been a nice budget alternative, a severe budget alternative compared to the $8,000 box for collectors, budget ballers, even younger fans. I think it would have been nice. And I think they could have used that model, that molded model for tons of, you know, fanatics, exclusive athletes in their rookie okay. season. They could have done it with Stroud. They could do it with uh, Caleb Williams or Jaden Daniels, who we'll talk about in a bit. Um, obviously, Wemby. So I, I think it's definitely something that they could take this Otani set mm -hmm. and just copy and paste it for these rookies and kind of have, a, obviously if the rookie sucks, then it, it, there's no point. But I think if you come out at the end of the season, you can pick one rookie from your Fanatics exclusive list who had the best season and make the set after that. And I think that's a good strategy. I'd like to see the price come down a little bit. So it's just more affordable for people. 
but $250 is definitely a lot better than $8,000. That is for sure. Oh, Jesus. Well, now that, now that you say that, it's it's like what Panini had with um, the Clay, the Caitlin Clark cards. Exactly. The same exact thing. Yeah, they made yeah. a set uh, about her collegiate career, and you could have pulled this card or this auto or that numbered card. Same exact thing. And that's like a $25 box. Mm -hmm. Same exact thing. I'm so happy you mentioned that because that's literally what I'm talking about is that, except just rookie season instead of whole collegiate career. Yeah, they also have right, pictures of her playing basketball as like a child, which I thought was pretty weird. But with who? They had pictures of her playing basketball as like a child, which I thought was pretty weird. But yeah, I, I could go without that. Unless you want to like short print those, you know, like, hey, here's the first game that they ever played in elementary school, and it's like a short print. Don't make it a base card because it's not about that. It's about that season. Again, you know, what I'm talking about is like the, that rookie season. Mm -hmm. So try to keep it to that. And then if right. you want to have a childhood card in there, it could be a short print. If you want to have like a family photo of like, hey, here's me after high school graduation, that's a short print. You know, just, you know, things to dice it up and mix it up. Obviously, you want your chase cards too, but keep it simple. Shouldn't be that hard. Fingers crossed. Yeah. I think the whole thing about this, these kind of sets is that there's only so many players that you can make them about. And that's why I would like it to be like the end of the season because, you know, if they did this for football with Stroud, obviously the first overall pick was Bryce Young. So that's kind of where you're leaning anyways. And you don't want to make a Bryce Young or Will Levis set for that matter. And they sucked. But if you wait till a month or so after the season, all right, CJ Stroud had the best rookie season out of the bunch of our athletes. Let's make a set about him. And then you mm -hmm. just pump it out, and then it's out on the market a month or two after after that decision's made. And I, I think that's a – you could do that with basketball once the season's over. All right, Brandon Miller, you know, played better than Wemby, for instance. So let's make a set about Brandon Miller. I don't know who the Fanatics athletes are this year for basketball. But, you know, for football, and this could segue us into our Jaden Daniels conversation, is you got Jaden and Caleb Williams. Caleb Williams has all the hype in the world being the first overall pick. But if the season ended today – Jaden Daniels is clearly the better player, so let's make the set about Jaden Daniels. And it comes out March, April, you know, whatever, you know, a couple months after the season's over. But yeah, let's talk about Jaden Daniels because you mentioned this actually in our little thing, you know, talk about how well he is playing. So I'll kind of – I'll ask you this question, and obviously you can answer it and give me your thoughts about it. If you had to build a franchise around one quarterback right now, after four weeks – Jaden Daniels or Caleb Williams. And Caleb Williams has looked a little bit better the last couple of weeks. I'll admit it. Who are you picking and why? I know it's tough for you because you live in Chicago. So put your bias aside. I was going to say, I'm not trying to be biased, but, you know, besides the whole marketable thing, Caleb Williams was – the number one pick for a reason. Like, he's good at football. You know, J Justin Fields, who just got his first loss, 3-1, and one, they were saying the same thing about him in Chicago. They were saying that he sucks, he can't play, he's not a good quarterback, blah, blah, blah. The same shit stuff they're saying now about Caleb Williams. It's – but Jaden Daniels does look good. Jaden Daniels looks very good. It's so tough to speculate these kids coming out of college because the game from college to the NFL is oh so different. I've done this exercise probably here on Hobby Talk. I've done this exercise in the shop a thousand times. Is over the last 10 years, how many of those quarterbacks have busted compared to how many of those panned out? I think the percentage is like 70% of first-round quarterbacks bust. And still too early for 2023, so I didn't really count them. There was no first-round quarterbacks besides Pickett. He's a bust. We can just flat out say that's a bust. But, yeah, like, yeah. everybody else – I mean, I even called Trevor Lawrence. You know, we're now on year four for a first-round pick, first overall pick. That, in my opinion, is a bust. But on draft day, he was the next Andrew Luck, the next Peyton Manning. He was the guy. He was the franchise guy for the next 15 years. And people had that same perspective with, with Caleb Williams. And I think Jaden Daniels – was more so of a second-round pick early on, and then he balled out, won the Heisman, and became a second-round pick. So, like, I feel like that hype train hasn't always been there until probably now, 
honestly, because there's been so much time to get caught up to that second overall pick. I, whereas Caleb Williams was pretty much the first overall pick two years ago. And I think it's, it's hard to say K, uh, Jaden Daniels is in a better spot than Caleb Williams, because I, I do think that the Chicago bears offense is better. Just that roster wise, you know what they have for players, yeah. but the commanders definitely do look good. And I say this, and I'll say this again, C.J. Stroud went into a better situation than Bryce Young, and that's why we're seeing the success out of C.J. Stroud compared to Bryce Young. Maybe, just maybe, the situation in Washington is better than it is in Chicago, despite us thinking and just kind of looking at rosters saying, oh, the Bears look better. Well, maybe the situation in Washington is actually better. So if you put Daniels in Chicago and Caleb in Washington, we may see different results. But I definitely love the hype that I'm seeing out of Jaden Daniels. It looks good. Yeah, man. I mean, he, he's legit. He looks great. He's putting balls where they need to be. He's making plays. So, I'll, he's is. Do we know anything about his uh, player exclusivity status? Fanatics. Fanatics. Him, Caleb. I think Drake may, but don't quote me on that. Um, not McCarthy. I don't think Bo Nix. I don't know if I can Google it real quick. How about Penix? Penix isn't. Uh, 2024. Oh. Fanatics. But yeah, so that, that means we're not going to get any. Well, not. I'm not always going to get any away, but. Flawless, National Treasures, none of those autos. Nope. And like, that's a disappointment in all honesty. I understand the business side of it. Obviously, the business side of it's very, very strong and popular these days, quite unfortunately, because like, besides base cards and some numbered cards and maybe some napkin patches, it's going to be tough to get these guys as autographs and just cool, nice cards. You know, again, unless they do like a Mercury set for Jaden Daniels at the end of the season because he is the better player just after year one. But um, I, I, I think... That, that's why you can't get people can't get caught up in the hype because if, if Jaden Daniels sucked, then he's going to get the excuse of, oh, he's a rookie quarterback. But because he's playing so well, now it looks like that Caleb Williams is a bust and that Jaden Daniels should have been the first overall pick. It's almost like a double standard that we're seeing in this league, which is quite unfair to Caleb Williams because he's, it's going to take time. It's going to take time. It's going to take time for any of those guys. Yeah. Right, let's see. Um, I'm trying to look at this roster. Sorry, go ahead. I just don't like how it's obviously not good for the collectors, but they try to spin it like it is. It's it doesn't benefit anyone but themselves doing all oh, this no, player exclusivity stuff. Uh, I'm just looking at the um, the list here. Uh, Anthony Richardson. It says Anthony Richardson's a Fanax exclusive athlete. So it says. But he is like autos starting, in Panini, so I don't know if it's new. Starting now, or I, it's just I'm looking at the Fanatics Authentic website, and I'm just looking at their roster of athletes, and I'm under the football section. Nick Foles is a Fanatics exclusive athlete. My God, um, so Nick Foles. Nick Foles. <laughs> uh, let's see who who, who else were we talking about? Oh, is Drake May? Is Drake May on here? Hold on. Um, it's in alphabetical order, so it helps. Oh, Drake May is on here. Uh, who's the other quarterback? Uh, Bo Nix. 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 Bo Nix is not on here. I know McCarthy's not on here. And then Penix, which I don't believe is on here. No, he's a uh, MSOP. No. So the only quarterbacks that we can get this year out of Panini products, licensed Panini products, is Bo Nix, Michael Penix. Who? Bo Nix looks okay. He's getting better. Penix isn't playing. And I guess neither is J.J. McCarthy. I guess you can get McCarthy, but he's not playing either because of an injury. So the top guys, Caleb, Jaden, and I know Drake May is not playing, but th third overall pick, can't get him. Cannot get him. And now, now it says that Anthony Richardson is, is a fanatic. I wonder if it's – That must, That must have been later because – 
I remember when this whole thing started happening that he was one of the ones that wasn't signed. He was like the quarterback that you could pull yeah. out of Panini product. On Fanatics' nice website one. right now, Ricky, I don't know how what comps are. You could buy an Anthony Richardson Indianapolis Colts autograph 2023 Panini Zenith two-color relic card number 202 serial numbered 127 out of 299 PSA authenticated nine rookie card. Guess how much? <laughs> Again, I have no idea what comps are, but they're selling Panini cards on Fanatics website. I think that's hilarious. Uh, they get that for 400 bucks. What'd you guess? 400? Yeah. 480. Close. 480. Oh. I don't think that's a $480 card. And then you can buy, you can even buy like mosaic silvers and immaculate base cards uh well immaculate out of 10 cards excuse me rookie rush cards i mean yeah they're selling panini cards out here maybe, maybe it is new maybe it, maybe it is a new thing i don't know but yeah anything else on Jaden daniels we can before we pivot to the next one no i just think that's that's what happens when you put someone in a good situation him stroud and then the opposite spectrum is Bryce Young. I'm not going to say Willow because I never thought he was good. Uh, Caleb Williams is all right. I think the, the Bears are, what, 2-2? Two two. He looks decent. Like, I'm not going to say he's done bad or he's done great. He's, he looks good. People, just hate, this... him he, people just hate him because he paints his nails, but... I was going to say, I think the scope on him is a lot brighter because he's the first overall pick. If he was the yeah. 32nd overall pick and he's 2-2 two and two or 0-4, oh I don't think people are caring as much about the performance or the nail painting or anything like that. Like, Bo Nix, I think, is 2-2, two and two and people aren't up in arms about it. I mean, he's a rookie quarterback. So, I mean, that's just – they're kind of living with it. But, I mean, when you're the first overall pick, second, third, whatever, if you're a top five pick, there's going to be a limelight on you that's pretty pretty bright that you need to uh, perform and live up to. And through two weeks, Caleb wasn't. Last two weeks, he has been. And through four, four weeks, Jaden Daniels has been. So it's it's just too early to tell. It really is too, too early. All right. Um, let's dive into the grading report, actually, because I think this is very interesting to discuss. Um, share screen. Ba -ba -bum. Can we see this? Oh, we can. All right. Ricky, they are grading almost a million more cards than the next company, PSA. But I will mention that they are minus 15% month over month and minus 2% year over year. In terms of looking at a specific player's card market, one would tell me that this is crashing. But obviously it's not crashing. But that's what people would tell me. If their card was, my, was down 15%, they would tell me that the market's crashing. But clearly, it, that's not the case. I just wanted to make a joke and poke fun at people. Looking at this, Ricky, what are your thoughts? What happened to my boy Beckett, man? In the shops, grading cards with Beckett, too. And we were sending out a decent amount of cards. Um. Still, minus 28%, though. That And minus 24% year over year. That's off that's tough yeah that's not great is it a beckett thing though are other companies just by and far better than beckett obviously psa is doing something extremely well i don't know if it's specifically psa that's doing it i guess that's a conversation a can of worms we can open if we want or is just beckett just shooting themselves in the foot uh because to see nearly well 28 percent, so almost three you know, 30% and then obviously almost 25% year over year down. Like CGC being 1% down year over year, that's nothing to worry about. Um, year over year for PSA, 2%, that's nothing to worry about. But 24% year over year, that um, could be worrisome for Beckett. So, Ricky, um, thoughts? Does, does this change your perspective on the grading landscape between the four? Does this make you want to grade one way or the other? Avoid grading at all? Talk to me on this one, because this one's a, a little a little puzzling to me. 
the year over year for SEC is really the only good number on this one, but maybe yeah. all of the uh, month over months being negative double digits, maybe that means people are grading a lot less. You know, being more selective finally, not grading, you know, junk. Big, <laughs> yeah. Boba Shat rookies or whatever, but uh, I, I think it's I, I think you're onto something there because I think I've definitely noticed since I mean August the shop did pretty well, so it's hard to say August, but I think September just show attendance, participation, uh, you know, foot traffic here at the shop. Just September seemed like it was just a naturally slow month across the board. Uh, there was nothing spectacular, I mean, you know, because Pokemon had a new set that released in in September, but I mean. This encompasses everything. So I'm trying, trying to think, you know, let's see, football started. So you'd like to think that there'd be a spike there, but there wasn't. Basketball, uh, nothing for basketball, nothing for hockey. And then you got baseball the playoffs, which I think we'd see more of an October bump for baseball. And we can go into the specific numbers here for, for each. But I do think that just – I think overall September was just kind of a down month. People are back to school. Vacations are over. They may be working overtime. Who knows what it may be. Uh, maybe they're trying to enjoy their last couple of nice days out and about. Sports, school sports. So, I mean, I think there's a lot that's kind of mixing into this. But here is the breakdown for not only the specific grading companies but the specific genres as well. And you could look at for PSA. Pokemon's down 26%. Baseball's down 16 Football, 6 Basketball, 4%. Is there any positive gains? Um, Beckett, 18... I'm not Beckett, I'm sorry. SGC, plus 18% for football, 2% for Pokemon. Otherwise, it's all down across the board for, you know, the main four categories. Mm -hmm. I just think... I think the hobby's just down for the month of September. I think we should look back at this in October or I should say the beginning of November for October and kind of compare and contrast. But if you show this list to, to somebody, they'll be like, oh, Ricky, Murph, it, it's crashing. It's crashing. Sell now. Get out of the hobby now. It's crashing. I told you it's coming. It's – sorry. I, <laughs> I tried to hold my laugh. It was so funny. Um, but yes, <laughs> sounds, you like, sounds like you get that a lot. More often than not. More often than not, oh, I bought this back in 2021. I bought it as an investment. It hasn't gone up in value. I just want to sell it. I just want to get my money back. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Your card's worth 80% of what it was three years ago. And then they don't want to sell because they don't want to lose money. And that's actually a video that I kind of wanted to make, which I haven't yet. But stay on the lookout for that. Exactly. But yeah, I mean, besides the, the mass amount of downward trends is there anything that we can take away from this useful maybe positive i mean yeah there's you know plus 79 percent for beckett in multi-sport but i mean what does that do for us plus 145 for sgc in multi-sport what does that do for us so well this could probably segue into the next segment but those those pokemon numbers are up it looks like a lot of people are. Is it just because a new set came out that people are grading a lot, or is it like it's growing in popularity? Or uh, let's find out. Gem, I want to uh, see. Let's see if I can go for it would August, August 2024 grading report. Let's see what it looked like in August. We can find it. Uh, oh no, this is still September. If I scroll further down, okay, so I can just hold on. Hold on. Oh, look at that! I can just scroll down. Uh, okay, so this is the just the overall numbers for the companies in August, the end of August, twenty twenty four. Uh, Beckett was up nineteen percent month over month. PSA was up plus you know month over month and year over year. Uh, and then of course they don't show me the <laughs> wow. I'll click on that. What the hell is all this? Oh, here we go. So, oh, so in August, so, so Stella Crown came out September 13th. 
the, this is August, and it's up 26% from July to August. This is TCG Pokemon. Up 26%. Now, you did have Shroud of Fable that came out in August. In June, you had Twilight Masquerade. So you look at this number compared to uh, September. September's down compared to August. I, I just, I, I think, and you're right, this could segue us into our next topic. I think Pokemon is just a really hot commodity right now. And I think people are realizing that there's no volatility compared to the others, to, to sports in general. And it's hard to say, oh, P um, Pokemon's up for all the grading companies, which is clearly not true. But it definitely is holding a lot of weight. CGC, massive in the Pokemon industry. Beckett, massive in the Pokemon industry. And they've always been a sports grading company. SGC, yeah. no one really cares about. But, um, but yeah, this is what August looks like here. Anything you want to kind of point out about this before we segue? Keep in mind, this is August now. Yeah. To the end of I mean, I know people like their BGS tens for Pokemon and everything else. Other than that, it's kind of a wash, unfortunately. Those black labels go crazy. Those black labels go crazy. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. You are welcome. All right, so. We alluded to it, so I segue into our next topic. We're going to be talking about Pokemon here, which we've been wanting to mix into Hobby Talk more and more, and we're going to be doing so now. And, Ricky, I want to ask you, you're fairly new into Pokemon. You can briefly ex explain how or why you got into it, for those that may not know. But I also want to ask you, if someone... Okay, so yeah. Say that first, and then here's, and then I'll give you my question afterwards. So, and I just uh, describe how you got into Pokemon. Well, no, I just started. You know, I've been buying here and there with you, and then I don't know. I just thought, well, I've been kind of losing interest in sports, besides like the guys like PC and uh, -oh, there's that face, but um. Yeah, no, I just started following the Pokemon groups on Facebook, saw what was out there, saw some cards I liked, and just went for it. Just got into I it. I just love the art. I'm still, I, mean, I still have a lot to learn about sets and all that stuff, generations, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm mostly just in it because they, because they look cool. So for someone that, that may have no idea about Pokemon. I'm not referring to you, but I'm just saying someone who was to approach you who has no idea about Pokemon or wants to start getting into it. Someone like yourself who's still learning, who has the cards, who's looking to buy and sell and trade, what would you kind of tell them now that you got your toes wet into the into the space of Pokemon? What would you tell them why they should start collecting? And is there any piece of advice that you can tell them that you wish you maybe heard before you decided to dive into Pokemon? <clears throat> now, it's, it, it's definitely a tough one because you, I mean, you, me, we're still learning Pokemon, and there's just so much involved with it. But in a good way, though, it's like none of it's like negative. The different sets, sure, but there's no volatility. There's no criminal charges. There's no performances that you have to worry about. So it's like a different. It's different. It's just like just like every other sport, t TCG, whatever. Buy what you like. Buy what you're interested in. Like I just said, I bought these cards because they looked cool. I don't know, like, yeah, I I like looked at what they sold for, the values, all that stuff. But I don't know. I didn't buy them because they're expensive or cheap or whatever. I bought them because I like them. Sometimes that's all it needs. It like that's all the reason it is needed is I like the cards. They look cool. I like the Pokemon. But like if you try to say that in sports, unless you're unless you're collecting like cheaper cards, oh I like I like Mookie Bats. Oh, I like Xander Bogarts. Oh, I like uh, I don't know, I'm 
Byron Bucks. I don't know. I don't know where that came from. Uh, unless they're like cheaper cards, the co- the it's your collection, and no one's gonna really say anything. But if you like, hey, here's an out of ninety nine of uh, Corey Seager. I love referring to Corey Seager. I think it's a great example. No one's gonna care about that because it's not cheap, but it's not nice. Like when I say nice, it's not expensive. Like when it comes to sports, it's almost like you need the expensive cards to not gloat or show off your collection, but to have any kind of status or mm-hmm. pedestal in in the sports hobby, sports card hobby. Whereas Pokemon, it doesn't matter if you got the nicest cards or the rarest cards or the or the most expensive cards. You just got the cards you like. And they in in the coolest looking cards can be five dollars. <laughs> That's the crazy thing. Is they can be super cheap. Have you ever considered getting into Japanese Pokemon? So another thing that I've learned is they're a lot cheaper here, obviously, than English cards. It might be the opposite in Japan, but um, which is a good business business opportunity, but no, but I I have no personal interest in Japanese cards. Maybe I've been caught up and brainwashed in the hype and all that stuff, but I all of the cards I have in are in English. When I see they're in Japanese, I kind of just scroll by them even if they're cheaper. But yeah, I mean I don't know why that is. It, it could just be because everyone else is that way too, but I don't have any interest in the Japanese cards. So for me personally, I like to be able to read the card. Um, I, I think that's a, I think that's the personal choice where a lot of people maybe fall into that. Maybe people just speak and read English. So they want nothing to do with anything else otherwise. But I think Japanese cards have a really good market. Unta- I don't want to say untapped market, but definitely an intriguing market here in the States because you're right. The, the boosters are cheaper. And the cool thing about the Japanese boxes is they come out like two months before the English sets. So for those oh. that may not know, and Ricky, I'm not, I think I'd probably explain this to you. Every one Pokemon set here in the States is two Pokemon sets in Japan. Why do they do that? I have no idea, but they do do that. So uh, Paradise Dragona just came out for Japan. Uh, actually, the same day Stellar Crown, the same day us in the States got Stellar Crown, September 13th. And then their next set is, I just had it, I got to look it back up, is Electric Breaker, which is going to come out October something, I think like another week or so. But those two Japanese sets are going to make our one Surging Sparks set here in the States. Now... Booster boxes range anywhere from $110 to $120, $30 uh, here in the States. But in Japan, the booster boxes range from $50 to $70. So if you were to get one set of Paradise Dragona and then another set of Electric Breaker for, let's say, $60, that's pretty much the equivalent to one English box here. Now you get 30 packs out of the Japanese booster for, again, $50 to $70, where you're getting 36 out of the states pack, out of the states booster box for again $120, $130. But the cool thing is, if you were to get one booster box of each, that's 60 packs for the same price as one booster box here in the states. Now, of course, you got to mix in the whole I can't read the cards. I mean, I'm, I don't know the, the pull rate situation because I'm still learning and diving into it a little bit. But I think the really cool, cool thing is, is it allows us access to the English cards early because if you pull the chase card that's going to be in the english set in the japanese set then you you already have the card a month or two in advance before it even hits the market here in the states now the market between japanese and english cards that that's a whole different story but i know the chase card let me uh i don't want this ad let me share my screen real quick so i can portray this a little bit easier Uh, so like this Latios card right here. That's so sick. So this is going to be... Oh, let me zoom back out now. This is going to be the chase card, or one of the chase cards here in the States. 
when it comes out uh, November 8th, I believe, Surging Sparks comes out. However, you can already buy this card now in Japanese, or you could have bought the box a month ago and, and attempted to open it. Then you got the Latias here. Beautiful looking card as well. Uh, I can't believe this ad. Goodbye. Uh, so again, I think that's where Japanese cards thrive compared to the States, is not only can you get them earlier than you do in the States, you can also potentially get them cheaper, at least in terms of the boxes, because the individual market, that that's just a whole can of worms. So by knowing this, Ricky, does this bring more appeal to the Japanese card market, or is it just the language barrier just does it for you? And I wouldn't blame you if, if that's the case, because it, yeah. it's definitely it's definitely a, a thing. That's what it is for me, man. Like, even if I were to get those chasers now, they still wouldn't be going for as much as they were in English, right? I'm assuming. So it's so weird. Some Japanese cards go for more than some English cards. Some English cards go for more than some Japanese cards. It there's really no formula or prediction method to figure it out. Um, so it's it's really tough to say. I mean, it it really kind of just comes down to pull rate. Is it easier to pull in the states or in ja uh, or in Japan? I think that's what it really comes down to. Yeah, because that that that's a whole different element too. Is is the the pull rates you know how you, tough go ahead is there anywhere that shows the stats like one in every x boxes or packs or something like that usually post release date you can kind of, you might be able to find that information on the internet i know for stellar crown there's a they opened like five thousand packs and they did an experiment and they were able to i think the lowest pull rate was one I think it was like 17 out of the 5,000 packs they pulled the card, that specific card. So, Jeez. like, it's it's more scientifical than anything, than, like, prediction-based. Like, you actually have to go open 5,000 packs to figure out the pull rates. So it's not, it's not them themselves releasing the stats. It's people finding out and then releasing Oh, them. no, yeah, no. Pokemon is, is not... Pokemon just controls the distribution of it. They're not telling us, hey, every one in 5,000 packs, you're going to pull this one card. Yeah. It's, it's, I guess it's not like sports cards in that sense where it's like you can expect two autographs per box on average. Like, you know, for Pokemon, you can't expect, uh, you know, one chase card, you know, one of these nice chase cards per box on average. Usually they're case, case hits. Loosely so, case hits. So they just release the cards and says and say, figure it out yourselves. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. They're like, good luck, guys. Oh, good morning. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, so that's our Pokemon discussion for the for the episode, which is very enlightening enlightening. Excuse me. Um, I think our next topic I would like to dive into is um repacks ricky so while i pull up the pictures and such could you maybe give me your thoughts and opinions about repacks whether you like them or you hate them you do them or you don't just what are your thoughts on on repacks so in the past i've gone off before on whatnot and repacks and all that stuff i personally don't have anything against repacks or whatnot, it's more so about the dishonest people who participate in us. I think repacks are fun, good idea, good way to get expensive cards if you usually don't, you know, have the money for them. But um, what was I gonna say? Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm pro repack if it's done correctly. So, what is correctly to you? You know, transparent about the floor, the ceiling, what's in it. You know, mm -hmm. not just basically being honest. Which not being scumbag. Not skipping over the 
the chaser because someone picked it or something like that. So I, I bring up I bring up repacks because I was watching Sports Card Radio and I don't watch the live stream. I kind of watch it uh, like the week, you know, the days after when I'm here at the shop and I got some time. You know, I'll listen to them. And they were talking about Card Vault. And I was like, oh, I love talking about Card Vault, as I'm sure you very much know. And I was like, oh, this is going to be good. And they're talking about repacks. So this is from, uh, I don't know if this is from Whatnot or Fanatics or Card Vault's website. I don't care where it's from. They were doing repacks. And just like your average breakers, you know, they have, hey, buy this and let's pull that out. Now, what I'm going to show you, which is pretty much every repacker, they don't have that transparency. They don't have a checklist. They don't have honesty. You buy it for $200, you get what you get. You might know what the, the ceiling is. Like, hey, look for a Patrick Mahomes auto. Hey, look for a, uh, a Josh Allen RPA. Like, that's what you're looking for. So, I so what they were saying on Sports Card Radio, which they go live every Thursday, Thursday night for that matter, is one of the hosts, uh, Ryan here, was leaked the checklist for these repacks from someone who works in Card Vault. Now, I think this is very intriguing because I don't think I can switch it from here. Uh, no, I can't switch it from here, so I have to do it the old-fashioned way. Uh, so someone leaked them. Oh, that's not it. Uh, this is the checklist. Someone leaked them the checklist. You're not going to be able to read it um, from here. It's, it's very it's a tough read. That. Yeah, no, it's there's no shot this gets read. Uh, actually, can I? Okay, yeah, that, that's a little better. All right, get the idea. Yeah, so, you know, here's the cards. This is how much it costs them. This is what the quote-unquote retail market price of the card is. I don't know what the color coordination means. I could really care less. But I guess, and I'm not going to throw names out there because we all, we, we both like this person. But this person had the checklist. And they got it from someone. who like The, the, the person that we both like was watching this break and participating in the I don't want to call it a break in this repack. And supposedly they had a checklist on hand. So they were able to know what cards are still available and what are actually the chase cards. Now, person, gotta switch back. This is a pain in the ass. Um, hold on, stand by. I'll get there. Back and forth, back and forth. This person here, which we both know, Smitty, is very close to this other person. And when you're doing repacks, especially the non-transparent, the non-honest versions of them, it is very easy to scam them, to know what you're pulling, knowing what you're saving for your friend, your acquaintance, whoever you're in, in cahoots with. So apparently, I guess the top four cards weren't pulled until the very, very end. Give or take. I mean, I haven't watched this in like four days, but, you know, that's get get the gist. So the person who he's close to was able to buy into these last four spots and pull the last four chase cards because they knew that they were still there, whereas the other people may not have because they don't have access to the checklist. Only uh. this person that... Smitty's close to. Again, I'm not going to throw names out there because we both like this person. And it's just this. Oh, I'm, I'm like pointing to the checklist and the checklist isn't even on the screen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I want to talk about this because Carvalt does have a footprint in the hobby. They are on whatnot. They're on, I think they're on Fanatics Live, whatever. They think that there's this big, great card shopping company but it's people like this businesses like this with models like this is what ruins it for the hobby and i, I just want to get your thoughts actually before i just keep rambling on just shoot your thoughts first um you know like, like i said it all comes down to honesty and transparency 
F. It's just disheartening, I think. And they're not the only ones doing this. I'm not just picking on I mean, I don't mind picking on them, but they're not the only ones that are doing this. I mean, there's other breakers and such are doing the same exact thing as well. And a friend of mine actually was just at Card Vault actually in Patriot's Place yesterday, literally yesterday. Walked in and I don't know what your perception of Card Vault is. I'm sure you're expecting nice fancy cards, tons of wax, the vault. Well, apparently there was like two or three cases and like for every foot of glass on a shelf, I don't know if that's a foot, man, give or take a foot, there was only one card. Maybe one card every two feet of, of glass, which is, I guess, you know, now we're getting big. And they were just like, meh. Like they weren't fancy or flashy or nice or yeah. crazy expensive. They were just meh. And I carry, I'll, I'll be honest. I carry meh cards because that's what people want and that's what sells. That's I don't what care sells. Yeah. Stuff. But when you're card vault with this podium and this platform and this vault experience, you're supposed to be selling the high end cards. You're supposed to be the place that local shops like me don't sell. People go there to spend the thousands of dollars on the cards. Right. But even them, they're dialing it back. They don't have the inventory. I don't know if it has anything to do with them just kind of transitioning to repacks because that just sells easier because people are brainwashed and they buy repacks because they think that's a good investment or what? I don't, I don't know. That's, that word this investment is, is something that word investment is something that gets thrown around too much. Way too much. Would you like to dive into uh, uh, <laughs> uh Crap, what is it? Investments? There we go. You want to talk about I feel like that's I feel like that's a topic for the next two weeks. But because I, I could go on about that. Uh so okay, so I guess we're kind of diving in a little bit to so like when people say they're investing in cards, right? What do you kind of think like just off the bat, what do you kind of think of that? Oh, they're investing in cards like players, quarterbacks. Um, you can even mix in the Pokemon aspect. I'm taking this down because I, I don't want to look at that guy's face. <laughs> so, like, when you hear the word investment, do you kind of like cringe a little bit because it's like well, of all yeah, the negative stuff from 2020, 21? When I hear the word investment, I assume someone wants to buy someone's cards and make money off it in a week or two. People do not have, people do not hold. Mm -hmm. They just want to buy it, sell it, flip it right away. When they say investment, they're like, oh, basically, do they have a good matchup next week? Are they going to go off and make, are their card values going to go up? So I make some money in a week. That's not, a, that's not an investment. That's a flip. We talked like about this all the times, and people just want to flip. Not, they want to buy it and flip it immediately. Sorry. Yeah, you're you're not an investor. You're you're a flipper. And yeah, I could I could go off. I could we could have a whole episode about this stuff. You're more than welcome to dive into it a little bit. We got a little bit of time. <laughs> you can scratch the surface, and it could be like a cliffhanger for uh for the next episode. Yeah, that, well, that that was that was my little cliffhanger right there. You're you're not an investor. You're a flipper. Learn learn what they mean. Okay, so can we definitively define the difference? Can we give both terms, flipper and an investor, a definitive definition? So, like, what would make well, obviously what makes one a flipper? You buy it now, you sell it tomorrow. You buy it now, you sell it quickly. You know, quick velocity. So, what would make want an investor if i want to be an investor but i don't want to come off as a flipper how do i make sure that i'm an investor because i do think investing in cards is a thing and it still can be a thing but it's a long-term game and we talked about this before but like what makes one an investor obviously long-term holds you got to hold the card you got to be patient is there like a specific player no i don't want to say a specific player is there like a specific time frame a specific dollar amount 
specific cards? Like what goes into making one an investor? When I think of investor, sports cards in particular, I think of someone like the old geezers who were like buy who bought Mickey Mantle slabs 30 plus years ago and still have them in their attic. That's what I think of when I hear investor. Someone who invests in people like Kenny Pickett and Desmond Ritter and Will Levis and all that stuff. Because that's just blind optimism. That's not investing. Could one become an investor today of vintage cards or just, I don't want to say vintage cards because I think there's more to investing than the than vintage, but vintage is obviously pretty much the big thing that people do invest in. But like Legends who are recently retired or on the brink of retiring, like, can I invest in Tom Brady cards now? You know, if I, as long as I hold them long term and I know that I need to be patient, I got to wait, you know, a year, three years, two years, five years, 10 years. Like, is it, can, can someone like me, you know, not an old geezer, or at least not yet, <laughs> still be, uh, still be an, an investor? Or is it just kind of perceived that? If you're in this hobby, you're buying cards, you're looking to sell at some point, then you're just a flipper. Like I, it's kind of a loaded I mean, yeah, you, could, you could still invest in Tom Brady. Like he's always going to retain his value, and that'll always steadily grow up. I mean, go up. Mm -hmm. But I mean, yeah, like, like I said. Investing to me is buying them and putting them in an attic, attic in a box that you'll forget about for 20, 25 years. Not, you know, buying one week and hoping to sell for more in a week or two. Yeah, that's... That's, that's not investing to me. That's flipping. So let, let me ask you this, because I, I completely agree with you. Could people still invest in new players? Young players, rookies, um obviously like your Wemby's, your Strouds, but even like a guy like T-Law or Justin Fields, obviously if they take those cards and put them in the attic and forget about them for 20 years, I, I guess that is, you know, kind of investing in those guys. But like, is that still a thing? Can we still invest in these guys? And I don't want to say potentially see good returns because obviously that's performance-based, but like, if I'm buying, if, if I'm buying Justin Fields right now, and I'm saying, oh, I'm investing in Justin Fields, people are probably going to get the notion that I'm just going to flip him. But if I'm buying him with the intention of holding him for a long period of time, is that still, like, in, in your point of view, is that still feasible to invest in newer guys, or mm. is that ship kind of sailed because there's just too much of the flipping component that goes into it? I mean, yeah, you could very well still invest in fields and other stuff. It's just when you're checking the week-to-week -week values of the cards that you have to see, like, if it's gone up or if it's gone down. Like, if it's gone down, are you going to panic so your investment because it went down in a week? Mm -hmm. That's that's the whole thing with me. Like, I think a lot of people oh, go can't ahead, be sorry. worried. Sorry, you can't be worried about the day-to-day -day value if you're investing. I think a lot of people try to look at sports cards specifically as day trading. They try to, but like not specifically the day though. Like they look at it as week trading. They buy CJ Stroud, they buy whoever on Monday, Tuesday, and then they go to try to sell them the next Monday or Tuesday to try to flip them after a good performance. And Sometimes that works, and all the power to you if it does. But like, that's not investing. Like, I mean, yeah, sure, a week is a long time for some people, and for most people, it's really not. A week goes by pretty quick. But like, that's not investing. And like, you're right, that's flipping. And sure, you can have an idea of you know wanting to flip the card, and then a good deal. I'm sorry, you want to invest the card, but then a good deal comes around, so you find yourself flipping it. Sure, that happens. But like, I I, I think you're right, right? I mean, I think investing is like. Getting the card, stashing the card, and like getting it out of your sight. Whether you know, in terms of day trading, deleting the app or putting it in a safety deposit box, putting it up in your attic, somewhere where it's out of reach, where you have to go above and beyond to get access to it. Yeah. Because I think people buy cards, put them in their case, put them in their bags, or whatever, and they always have easy access to it. 
So therefore, it's hard to invest in it because, oh, you want to trade? Let me show you what I have. Oh, you're looking to buy? Let me show you what I have. Oh, you want that Justin Fields card? Oh, I'll just sell it to you for, you know, whatever percent, you know, whatever dollar sign it is. Yeah. When, when you're investing in a card, there are two points that you should be worried about its value. When you buy it and when you sell it. Not every day. Shouldn't be looking at the comps every day and all that. Just you worry about the value when you buy it and when you sell it. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think with I think flipping and investing are two different animals. Sure, there's some overlap. How much you're buying the card for? What are you looking to sell it for? Sure, but I think the biggest difference is is the the time window of ownership. I guess you know you could own a card for six months but still not invested in it maybe you just sat on the card because you got lazy or you couldn't sell it or mm -hmm. whatever the case may be um, but I, I do definitely do think that investing in sports cards at the very least i mean it's not letter of the law but i kind of look at it as like a year I, I think a good year is a good investment you know you buy uh, i'm just trying to think you know roman anthony right now and then this time next year you hope he's you know, coming off a great rookie season, you're hoping that he had a huge impact on a hopefully playoff uh, Red Sox team. His cards should be worth more than what you bought him for at least this time because right now, you know, the market an, for anyone that's not in the playoffs are low. He's a number one rated prospect, so that shit may have sales. Crazy. Right? Crazy. Right? Thing. I think great. And then Kristen Campbell got the most improved or something like that, breakouts. I saw that. I saw the Red Sox uh, future is definitely looking bright, but they definitely do have a major league talent problem, not a prospect problem. So, and I mean, so, over the, what's sorry. that? It's so funny because Orioles built their roster because they were bad for a decade. Red Sox didn't really have a period in which they were terrible for a long time. Let me ask you this, Ricky. Um, and then we can get our to closing takes. Would you rather – so in a 10-year window, would you rather suck for nine of those years and then have one championship in the middle? Or would you rather be uh, good, great for those 10 years, but fall short in the championship game? So basically Red Sox or Yankees? <laughs> Pretty much. I'd rather, I'd rather be the Red Sox. So I understand that point because you get the championship out of it. But I like the other end of it where you're in competition for 10 years. Yeah, it sucks, but like any of those ten years, you could pull out and win. I mean, people say, "Oh, look at the Buffalo Bills; they they went to four Super Bowls and they didn't win one." Yeah, but at least they were there, and they had the opportunity and they had the chance to win. If you're at the bottom of the barrel, you don't have no damn chance, and you know to do yeah. anything. So, I mean, that's kind of yeah. You want the championship at the end of the day, but when I have a chance for multiple, may not get it, but when I have a chance for multiple, that's kind of appealing to me, in my in my opinion. But Ricky. What are your outgoing takes as we wrap up a, a wild episode? I mean, we were kind of all over the place talking about a bunch of different things. And um, just what, what do we got? What do we got as we uh, wrap this episode up? Oh, well, no, I just want to say honesty and integrity and all that transparency go a long way in this hobby, whether it's whatnot or selling on eBay or selling on Facebook or doing deals with your friends. Like money could – ruin a relationship like that always you know you always got to be forward honest and stuff like that it'll, it'll get it'll get you a longer way than worrying about every penny that's very uh very wholesome i like that it's very uh right? it's like from the heart almost i i think i'm getting choked up a little bit um <laughs> i I agree with you. Honesty, integrity, transparency, uh, they're all the best policies, not not to sound like a you know, like a nerd, but that's true. And I think that goes for not just the hobby or sports cards or Pokemon. I think that goes for every form of business or any form of walk of life. You know, it's not that hard to be a good person. It's really not. It's actually harder to be a mean and bad person, to be honest, because you have to have a, a deliberate agenda, a negative deliberate agenda to go out and be a bad person. Where mm -hmm. saying hi, how are you? or being honest, being transparent about pricing, not that hard. Really pretty easy to tell the truth, believe it or not. But um, my outgoing take is I'm going to kind of gear towards football because I think it's such a, uh, an important time right now for the, the football card market because we just had the first four games, so the first month is out of the way. And I think a lot has changed between now and 
what we kind of perceived the NFL season to look like or, you know, where we thought these quarterbacks were going to be or where these teams were going to be. Uh, but I think patience, I think, is a really big one. Uh, just last year, I think C.J. Stroud kind of blew up overnight. Jaden Daniels is kind of doing the same thing. But these next four games, he could continue to go up or he could continue to crash. A guy like Bo Nix could just hit, go through the roof or he could crash. So I, I think being patient and just kind of taking it slow, don't get caught up in the hype, and just be smart with your investments or your flips or whatever you buy. You know, you know, look at it from multiple different angles so you have multiple different ideas of what you're actually getting into. So that's probably my biggest uh, outgoing take there. But, Ricky, it was an absolute pleasure. As always, As I'm very always. excited for next episode. Hopefully, I'll be here for next episode or be able to do it, which I should. I say, you might, you might have a special guest next episode. That's what I'm thinking. I, I don't know. I, I, you know, with the way the scheduling is working out, you know, making this episode was probably the one that I thought I was going to miss the most. And the next episode yeah. is going to be, I don't even know what day it's going to be on. Um, the 17th. That could get froggy. I have no idea, but we'll figure it out. We'll def but maybe there will be a oh, guest. So. Maybe there will be a third co-host <laughs> for Hobby Talk. Who knows? Um, but thank you guys so much for watching. Please press all the buttons, like, comment, subscribe. Make sure you check out Ricky's channel, his Instagrams as well. And um, thank you guys so much for watching, and we will both catch you for the next one. But until then, see you guys.